It's a great pleasure to be here with you all this morning. And uh, as I said, fascinating talks already. Um, so I'm just going to take you on a, a little journey that we took last year up to the north of Ireland. And so we were very lucky to, to get out and about last year in, in, the, in the, the summertime. So this I'm going to take you through the history of Cloudbury, which is this little uh, Rubus Shammy Morris in Ireland. And it's really been seen very few times over the last nearly 200 years. And this is the, the finger of Ian McNeil, uh, who the order of the Flora Tyrone, who was leading the way on this expedition. And on the top right, you can see a picture that we never see in Ireland, which is the fruiting Rubus Shammy Morris. So anyway, I'm just going to give you a little overview, introduce it introduce you to it. You can see it's this uh, very typical looking little rubus leaf here, very quite indistinct. It's history in Ireland and really look why it's so rare and maybe a little bit look to the future for Cloudbury. And uh, so I'm just going to introduce you. So it's in the rose family. So it's um, one of the very biggest families in the world. So there's, there's nearly two, people estimate between three and 700 species in this family. So it's part of a bit huge family. It's a boreal circumpolar species. So basically it, it likes the colder part of the world. It likes up near the, the North Pole. And uh, it's very abundant in the Nordic countries. And uh, in Finland, it features even on the two euro coin and it grows in pine fens. So with these uh, dwarf uh, birch and, and heather up there. So just there it is, the two euro coin. And there's a little view from the North Pole down. So you can see the red splodges are where it likes to grow and the red dots are the outliers. So you can kind of see it definitely likes um, the, this boreal kind of habitat. So in Finland, it really thrives. And and there's a great YouTube video I had hoped to share, but it didn't quite work. But here you can see um, this guy out picking lots of cloudberries. So you can just notice here just the habitat in a, in a way that it's the vegetation is very short. The pines look very stunted. It's very, very short vegetation, very exposed. And uh, you can see he actually collects like huge bucketfuls of these. So that's a kind of a YouTube. So if you want to see what cloudberry looks like when it's thriving, just uh, go on YouTube there. So looking at it in Ireland and in Britain, you can kind of see in the Scottish Highlands, you can see the distribution there. Um, it's widely distributed and uh, really it's not on the islands. The only island is on Orkney. And in Northern England, very common plant on uh, blanket bogs, especially in the North East Pennines. And uh, so for, and in Wales, we just have seven little dots there. So quite rare in rare, Wales considered near threatened there. However, when we look at the situation in Ireland on the island, of Ireland, we just have one little dot here um, up in County Tyrone. So there it is. So it's it looks very um, kind of lonely and alone there compared to uh, the situation in, in Britain. So discovered in firstly in 1826 by uh, Professor Murphy and Admiral Jones and Admiral Jones, very famous for some lichen records. And uh, he wrote on a mountain west of Dart. He couldn't give any nearer locality because they were covered by a wet fog at the time. So many of us been up in mountains. We get turned around a lot and uh, being in a wet fog can be quite a common thing. And they described it as plentiful on this Glen Garrow mountain. So there was a little bit of debate early on about where this Glen Garrow and west of Dart actually was. But they collected, a, a Admiral Jones collected a herbarium specimen and amazingly, we still have this specimen here in uh, Glasnevin today, which is fabulous. You know, we can actually go back to that original specimen collected uh, by Admiral Jones in 1826. And it's a shame we're not in Glasnevin today, it would be a real treat to show you uh, this specimen. And it's very important. Um, this Basically, this specimen uh, has never been seen flowering since this one in 1826. So it's a, it's a very important specimen. It's great we have a record. Of it. So it was lost for many years then, and Robert Lloyd Prager, who we all know and follow around the place, uh, he's considered like our, our great um, father of, of botany in Ireland. And uh, so basically, the many people went out to search, including Prager, and uh, some even with the herbarium specimen doubted Admiral Jones uh, the identity of the specimen, which was quite unusual. And Prager infamously said, I'd be really slow to recommend any botanist to devote his time and money to the fruitless search in such a desolate and uninteresting wilderness. Well, 
this was Prager's unsuccessful attempt in 1892. So here's Matthew Jeb, and that's Prager there. So here's Matthew Jeb and Ian McNeil, the author of The Flora of Tyrone, really. And I think Ian's flora showed how rich uh, the flora of uh, Tyrone is and that it's not uh, this wilderness uh, where um, Rubus Shammy Morris grows. This is definitely not an uninteresting place to visit. However, I would agree in some way because it, it's very samey when you're up there. You're kind of going, hmm, there's not why is um, this place where Ruba Shammy Morris grows and not on that other bump over there or that other hill over there? So it's it's very strange, really, where it grows. Um, so anyway, Prager set out in 1892. Really, there everyone was setting out because of the new edition of Sibylle Hibernica coming out, and they wanted to confirm the record. So Barrington and Hart set out there, but they were unaware of Prager's unsuccessful search. So I, I say if they had um, thought Prager had searched it, maybe they wouldn't have set out. And that would have been more is the pity um, because uh, Barrington and Hart actually relocated the plant on or near the, what they think is the original location on the 10th of August. So they, they were in, in, in but it, it, there's a great, uh, they and strongly impelled because Admiral Jones could not have been mistaken. Um, so that was 66 years after the original record. So a long time between between records here in the Sparrens. And uh, and as I said, they weren't aware of Prager setting out and uh, and probably thankfully so. And here's the specimen, and there's a lovely telegram that accompanies this specimen in the Botanic Gardens in uh, in the herbarium, and you can kind of see all the nice handwriting there and the specimens they collected. So we can see the size of the leaves, we can see the rhizomes, we can see the pedioles. So it's great to have these old records, just even for for looking at the size of the plant through the years and 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 different things. So it's um, so there's a nice record and the telegram, the great exciting telegram about refinding it. Um, but as uh, in the early days, when Mur when Murphy and Jones said, you know, that it was like abundant on Glen Garrow, but here you can see um, the different this. When they found it, Hart and Barrington, they said it's almost choked by sphagnum and stunted ling and it's thinly scattered, minute leaf. The petiole barely brings it to light. So they were quite worried about it. They found no traces of flowers or fruits on it and uh, they, they were quite worried about it. And again, the letter, a keen struggle for life and that no effort should be spared in protecting one of Ireland's most interesting plants. So this was Hart's in 1892. So then sporadic records really through the years and uh, now thankfully, uh, so in 1958 from Queens, Paddy Kirtland and uh, some people from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency in the 60s, but it really wasn't until uh, David McNeil kind of found the six figure grid references in 89 and that it was kind of been properly tracked and mapped since then. And uh, so the McNeils visited a lot during the 90s and um, they noted that uh, bog cotton was not present on earlier visits um, to the site in, the, in, in 89 onwards, but it was becoming a lot more prevalent on the site through the 90s. Um, we have a wonderful um, kind of record from David Holyoke in 2003, and David is mostly famous for his, his bryophyte work, but he has provided really the first 10 figure grid reference and, uh, and the GPS derived altitude. So uh, David's um, a very accurate 10 figure grid reference is what we base uh, these maps on now. So now we know exactly where it is. So David counted 19 plants um, with two or three leaves each and uh, about four centimetres in diameter as leaves. So um, Ian himself visited in 2007, but he said he had, you know, three unsuccessful attempts before the, the last visit in 2000, but his last visit in 2007. So with that in mind last year, and uh, I know Matthew had been on about this plan that we must go out in search of it. And it's always been kind of like a, a coffee break favorite that we must go up in search of uh, Rubus Shammy Morris. So it was becoming a bit of a worry that uh, like Ian hadn't seen it since 2007. And uh, so with that, we set out last year with Ian and Matthew Jeb and myself in July, at the end of July last year. And we were very excited because we refound it again. So we found nine plants. So this was down from the Holy Oak 19 and we found four little subpopulations and we noticed that the leaves were a lot larger than the previous records uh, for the population in 1892 and 93 from the herbarium specimens um, and so here it was here we found it here so the leaves were quite broad you can see this one is just a little bit bashed maybe just from the the dry summer but it was actually doing 
um, quite well. And, but it was definitely, you can see, um, you know, the vaccinium there in the Kaluna. So it was a little bit choked out, but it, it seemed to be uh, doing uh, well enough. And uh, well, when you scratched away down below, you could kind of see the, the little buds and the petioles and the rhizomes. They're all basically quite healthy. It was doing quite well underneath. So that was quite um, nice to see that it was actually doing quite well. So why is it so rare? And like you know, the reason for this extreme localization island, we don't really know at this stage, like the species is so stable in habitats in Scotland and Northern England. Um, so it's presumed this colony has been here in Ireland since uh, maybe since the Ice Age. And uh, it's a very limited area. So this one little spot um, up in the Sperrins, and it just makes a single male. So cloudberries is dioecious. So it has male and female flowers and separate plants. And uh, so really we, we're ruling out the seed protect, uh, production and maintenance of any genetic variation. So this is the, the flower, the only flower ever found on that Admiral Jones specimen. So you can hide to see here, uh, we assume a male because we don't um, kind of feel the, uh, the ovary and stuff, but basically, um, the blanket bog where it grows is weathered, grazed, burnt, trampled, eroding. And in terms of fitness for survival, people think that this particular clone of cloudberry, this particular uh, uh, cloudberry male is a very significant because it's a, he's a bit of a toughie. He's able to tolerate this extreme edge of the range uh, climate envelope for the species. And uh, as I said, so the challenge is really lying ahead for this species in Ireland. So climate change. So Ralph Forbes said, you know, basically it's been here since the Ice Age and it failed to eliminate, uh, eliminate this relic uh, male, pop this population. However, further global warming might finish the job. So again, the warmer and the wetter summers, which are a bit of a worry. So Ian McNeil himself said the surrounding mountaintop is subject to deterioration and peat hags. And some of the hags are getting dangerously near the cloudberry and that's from his flora Tyrone. So, and we definitely seen um, some of the, I just put up the peat hag here, which is just above the population. So you can kind of see there's a lot more bog cotton around. You can kind of see the erosion. Uh, so I chatted this lovely local landowner last year. His name was Peter McSwiggan. And uh, it's the, the, land, the area itself is on a, a piece of commonage utilized by a number of local farmers. And very sadly, I'd like to say today that Peter passed away in February 2020, 21 in May he rests in peace, a lovely man, very nice to chat to about this plant. So he was a farmer and he was well aware of the plant on his land. And uh, there's a good interest in, in with the landowners on that. And it's a Northern Ireland priority species, of course. So when we came back from the, um, the visit, we were very excited and we really would like to bring this clone into cultivation in the National Botanic Gardens because a few cuttings could hold all the genetic variation for this uh, particularly important uh, individual, individual population. So there has been uh, cuttings taken successfully in the past in May and August, so we're hoping to go up again. So I was very excited. I got my license in uh, September, 25th of September, 2020. And this was instead of my license to kill, this is my license to trail that it granted me a license to get some material for a study to try and grow this. Uh, however, when we visited again on the 29th of September, so a couple of days after I got the official license, we set off uh, uh, again. And this time I set off with Abby Maiden from uh, Diera, and we found no plants, um, which was really shocking. And Abby still smiling, even though I traipsed her over lots of mountains, saying it was definitely here, it was definitely here. She was still smiling. So that was in September 20. So I can kind of see. Um, you know, why Prager, why you go up there and you totally, you wouldn't find it. it it's it's just um, very elusive. But what we did find was loads of poop there. And uh, so obviously the sheep had been true, um, but this was in September. So when I talked to Ian about it, he said, well, he thought we might be too late. And he's also, also gone in September. Um, but he just said, don't be too hard on the sheep. So I was like, um, the sheep have eaten them all. But anyway, you know, so anyway, I'm hoping next year that the, the rubus will arise like a phoenix from the flames or basically like a rubus from the poo and that we might have some hope of, of seeing the population again, but I'm pretty confident it's, it's probably still there. And the other hope is that, uh, is, is it, could it possibly be the only Irish record? Um, there was great hope from the Kingdom of Kerry that this lady here, um, Ms. McCallum Webster, she found it on the Dingle Peninsula on a BSBI excursion to Kerry. And she was unaware that it was so rare in Ireland and she failed uh, to take a specimen and apparently she's a very excellent recorder and a very precise person so so if she's seen it there's a very good chance that it is
is on the Dingle Peninsula. And, uh, and even in Queen's Botany, the partner Kirtland was saying that we do hope that the situation will be rectified, that a second, uh, second population will be found for Ireland. And I suppose this is a great uh, challenge for the kingdom and a challenge for Rory coming up as well. That, uh, and everybody um, in the BSBI Kerry group there, that you keep your eyes uh, peeled for Ruby Shani Morris. Now, I'm showing you this glossy, juicy picture. Apparently, the fruits aren't that tasty, um, but maybe just a possibility for Ireland that um, if we do get some cuttings, then maybe we can introduce this gent to some nice, uh, some nice Finnish ladies, and that maybe we can, you know, there's there's ways we can maybe get some fruit uh, on it. So there's no uh, end to the potential of what we could maybe do. But I suppose really it is just to secure this particular uh, hardy genotype in in cultivation for the future. So uh, thanks for listening today and thanks for your time. And I hope you all uh, head out and look for some cloudberry this summer. Thank you.